Good morning. Hope you are all keeping well. Greetings to you, the KPMG team in Oman. I'm Ashok Ariharan. I lead the tax practice for KPMG in Oman, and I will be the moderator for today's seminar, which will focus on the transport and logistics sector. A few administrative matters. You may key in your questions through the Q&A tab, which will be seen only by the panelists. Some do prefer to send their questions through the chat box, which is fine with us. I think you should be aware that the questions will then be seen by all the attendees. We'll address your questions during the Q&A session. Do not have to wait for the presentation to end to post your questions. After the webinar, please do take a minute to provide your feedback. Your comments are always valued. Finally, this session is being recorded for your benefit. Businesses are very busy running against time to get ready for the VAT go live date of 16th April 2021, which is only 36 days away. We have had two very interactive seminars this week focusing on the manufacturing and retail sectors. Next week, we will be covering oil and gas, power and utilities, and real estate. Let's look at, this, at, at the agenda for this webinar, which we expect will take about an hour. After my introduction, we will provide you with a status update, including where the tax authority is on the long overdue executive regulations. We will then take you through the Oman VAT framework specified in the law issued five months ago. We will deal with specific issues for the transport and logistics sector. As you are aware, this sector is an important priority area for the government's diversification agenda. This has been reiterated in Oman's Vision 2040 document. We will cover issues such as what could be covered within services in connection with international transport? This is a crucial question because the, such services do qualify for zero rating. What about inbound versus outbound transport? What are the VAT implications for each? How would transshipment be treated? What are the VAT issues if your entity is located in a free zone? Apart from understanding the VAT issues, you need to also make sure that your IT systems understand the VAT requirements. What changes do you need to incorporate in your ERP to not only deal with the day-to-day -day transactions, including raising VAT compliant invoices, but equally important to generate reports that would be required for reporting to the tax authority? Currently, we understand that this will be on a quarterly basis. After the IT considerations, we will identify the next steps for you to be ready for the go live date. I'm pretty sure businesses will get there as they did in Saudi Arabia, UAE and Bahrain, despite many challenges they had to deal with. However, go live date is not the sole objective. You need to be confident that your VAT implementation stands scrutiny later by the tax authority. You would also need to take into consideration new clarifications and guidelines, which are bound to be issued after the go live date as both businesses and the tax authority settle into the new VAT era. You will need to get continued guidance from your advisors and the tax authority. We at KPMG continue to be engaged with the tax authority for our clients' benefit. In order to take you through all these matters, we have a distinguished panel of VAT specialists. We have Abba, who hopefully is a familiar face, having been in Oman for the last three years. She has not only helped us establish a strong indirect tax practice in Oman to complement our well-recognized corporate tax practice, but has also been playing an important role in sharing insights on VAT to businesses and indeed the tax authority based on our experience 
in the GCC states and in India. We are supported by Rob Dalla Costa, a very experienced senior advisor who has spent his last five years in the GCC region, including Oman. Rob has closely worked with us during our long engagement with the tax authority to assist them with the design of the VAT system, including drafting of the VAT legislation. Lastly, we have Julie, who is not only a VAT specialist, but more importantly, a tax technology specialist. She has been helping a number of businesses in Oman upgrade their ERP systems to deal with the Oman VAT law. I will now request Abba to give the VAT status update and take us through the Oman VAT framework. Thanks, Ashok. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us this morning. So uh, a quick status update. The VAT law was published on the 18th of October 2020, takes effect 180 days from the date of publication, which is why we go live with VAT right in the middle of April on the 16th of April 2021. In January this year, the tax authority has issued three decisions of which two are on registrations and one on the zero rating of certain food items. The registrations related to decision, uh, the, regis the decisions related to registration, one reiterates the monetary threshold for mandatory and voluntary registrations. So mandatory registrations for businesses with supplies in excess of 38,500 Omani reals per annum. Voluntary registrations for businesses with supplies or expenses in excess of 19,250 Omani reals per annum. The other decision on registration staggers the registration as well as the go live. This is quite similar to Bahrain, but the monetary threshold is different in Oman. So businesses with annual supplies in excess of 1 million Omani reals must register with effect from 16th April 2021. Half a million to a million Omani reals need to register with effect from 1st of July 2021. Quarter of a million to half a million from 1st October 2021. And 38,500 to quarter of a million from 1st April 2022. Businesses eligible for voluntary registration may apply at any point in time. There are different registration processes for resident businesses with commercial registration resident businesses without commercial registrations and non-resident businesses. The monetary threshold does not apply for non-resident businesses liable for registration in Oman. Now, the tax authority has launched the registration portal on the 1st of February, 2021, and it remains open for the first tranche of registrations till the 15th of March. Although the criteria for tax grouping hasn't been published, the portal allows registration of tax groups. But in order to create a tax group, all members of the tax group must first be registered independently. And while the law sets out the framework, as I see, the devil lies in the detail. The details on several substantive as well as procedural aspects are expected to be set out in the regulations. The final regulations, as Shok mentioned, are currently awaited. Technically, the tax authority has up to six months after go live to publish the executive regulations. So in the worst case scenario, the final regulations may be published as late as October 2021. Now, based on the discussions we've been having with the tax authority, we know that they are working with the Ministry of Justice and Legal Affairs to release them as soon as possible and hopefully before go live. The tax authority is also working on general and sector specific guides to allow businesses better guidance and clarity to be able to implement VAT. But even then, at this point in time, there is clarity required on several aspects for businesses to plan for implementation and more importantly, make system changes. And while we've listed a few matters that we expect to see in the executive regulations, this list unfortunately is only illustrative, not exhaustive. Clarity is also awaited on certain notification or approval processes, whether these are procedural or whether these are substantive. So, for instance, deferral on import VAT, uh, billing arrangements, exemption from registration for businesses making zero rated supplies. All of these are provided for in the law, but the detail around this is expected in the executive regulations and the manner in which these need to be uh, requested for from the tax authority will be by way of a separate process. And all of this needs to be done before go live on the 16th of April 
2021. So that's the gist of where we are at this point in time. Now let's move on to how OmanVAC will work once we go live. If we can move on to the next slide, please. So VAT, as the name suggests, is value added tax. It is an indirect tax which is charged on the value that is added at each stage in the supply of goods or services. As an indirect tax, it is supposed to be passed on to the final or the end customer. That's you and me as individuals. The business is only acting as an intermediary, collecting, this, collecting the tax from the customers and paying it to the tax authority. So ideally, this is not supposed to be a cost to the business. Uh, only in circumstances where the supply that a business makes is exempt, it could mean that the input tax of VAT paid on purchases is not recoverable for the business. In such circumstances, the business which is making the purchase effectively becomes the end customer. But in order to pass this cost of VAT on purchases on to the end customer, the business, for commercial reasons, results to an increase in the price of the supplies that it makes. As I said, it is a value added tax. And in order to make sure that it functions as a value added tax, while there is the mechanism of output tax, that is the tax that is charged on supplies, there is an equally uh, important process of recovery of input tax, which is the VAT, which is paid on purchases. And both put together, work to make the tax a value added tax. Now, value added tax in different names, whether it's value added tax or goods or services tax, goes back to the 1950s, originated in France in Europe, just to make sure that there was a harmonized system of tax, um, which integrated uh, the different types of retail sales tax that existed earlier on. In the GCC, this is as recent as 2016 and 17, when the GCC countries, as a agenda of economic diversification, resorted to the implementation of VAT. So far, across the globe, 169 countries have implemented VAT. Within the region, we've had UAE and KSA implement VAT from the 1st of January 2018, and Bahrain uh, from the 1st of January 2019. Now, let's move on to some of the concepts which are important under VAT. We won't be touching upon all of them. We're presuming that VAT implementation less than one month away. We are all familiar with these in some shape and form. So we'll just recap on how these work and why are they important so that you are able to appreciate the issues that we discuss better. Now, we've already spoken about registrations. Supply. Supply is extremely critical to VAT because at the end of the day, value added tax is imposed on supply supply of goods, supply of services. And in certain instances, even when the essentials of a supply are missing, it is extended by way of a deeming fiction to certain transactions that in common parlance do not qualify as a supply. We'll deal with deemed supplies in just a bit. Time of supply is important because it helps you ascertain at what point in time the back obligation of a business arises. Place of supply is important because it helps ascertain which country or which tax authority has the jurisdiction to levy tax on a particular transaction. Value of supply is critical because you need to know the value on which you need to pay tax. Usually this includes monetary as well as non-monetary consideration, but there are certain other inclusions too. Uh, and while that's increasing the tax base, you're also allowed certain deductions so it's important to understand what is the tax base for you to discharge your VAT obligations on in the right uh, amounts. Reverse charge. Usually, VAT is a tax which is collected by the supplier and paid to the tax authority. So the charge is on the supplier. In certain circumstances, the charge is reversed. Instead of VAT being charged by the supplier, the VAT has to be paid by the recipient, which is why the name reverse charge. Which are these circumstances? Import of goods, import of services. In both these instances, your supplier 
who is an overseas entity, is unlikely to be registered in Oman and will therefore not charge you a VAT on the supplies that they make, which is why it then becomes critical for the business that is in Oman and registered for VAT purposes and importing these goods or services to understand their VAT obligations under the reverse charge and discharge them. Input tax credit is critical to the entire scheme of VAT because that's how VAT uh, up works. Uh, the value added tax works and then compliances. So if we can move on to the next slide, let's look at the different types of supplies. These are these are terms that you would hear very frequently in any discussion that revolves around VAT, but these are only some of the different types of supplies. Standard rated supply, where VAT that is charged by the service provider is at the standard rate. The standard rate in Oman is expected to be 5%. In fact, the whole of GCC, uh, when the countries implemented VAT, they all implemented VAT at 5%. The only exception so far has been Saudi that increased the rate from 5% to 15% last year. If you look at the global average of tax rates, VAT rates, it lies between 15% to 20%. So when we say standard rated supply, the service provider provides services charges the standard rate of 5% on the supply and because there is a VAT on the supply is able to recover the VAT that it incurs on the purchase of goods or services used in making such a supply. Zero rated supply is an extension of taxable supplies. Only the rate of VAT applicable is 0%. So VAT is charged but at 0% and the supplier is still eligible to recover the VAT that is incurred on the purchases used to make such a supply. Exempt supplies, although they seem similar to zero rated supplies, are not the same. Here the supplies are exempt from VAT. The service provider does not charge a VAT. And because these are transactions exempt from VAT, the service provider is also not eligible to recover VAT incurred on the purchases. So this is extremely important to understand because it may seem similar to zero rating where there is no VAT on the supply, but it's different because here the supplier does not have the right to recover the VAT, which then becomes a cost to business. If we move on to the next slide, we'll see how you should be ascertaining what is exempt, what is zero rated, and whatever is not exempt or zero rated would be a standard rated supply. Couple of types of transactions or supplies that we didn't discuss were suspensions and out of scope supplies. And we'll touch upon that in just a bit. But if you look at the list of supplies which are exempt or zero rated, exemptions, what's critical uh, in the transport and logistics sector is the local passenger transport, which has been exempted. But what is the scope of local passenger transport? What are the conditions for the exemption? are expected to be set out in the executive regulations. Zero rating, important for the sector as Ashok mentioned earlier. International or intra GCC transport of goods or passengers is expected to be zero rated. Supply of services in connection with such transport will be zero rated. In addition to that, means of transport that are used for transportation of goods or passengers for commercial purposes is zero rated and supply of goods or services in relation to supply of qualifying means of transport is also zero rated. Now, in addition to this, um, we also need to look at a few other types of supplies, suspension that we haven't discussed earlier, which is essentially extended to supplies that are made to, from, and within special economic zones, or in case of import of goods under a custom suspension. So you will not pay VAT until the point in time the goods are or the services are under suspension. As soon as the suspension is released, you will incur a VAT obligation. And then last category, which is out of scope. By their very nature, these supplies for the purposes of VAT or these transactions for the purposes of VAT are not supplies and therefore considered outside the scope of VAT. 
But the question that you need to consider when you have such transactions is that because they are out of scope, does that impact your ability to recover input tax of VAT on the purchases that you've used for making such supply or used in the execution of such transactions? That's the exemptions, zero ratings and suspensions. Again, unless a transaction categorically qualifies for any of these special treatments, it would be standard rated. If we can move on to the next slide, please. We then talk about deemed supplies. Now, the basic premise for a deemed supply is that the business should have recovered input tax on goods or services used to make such supplies. When do we extend the scope of supplies to make them deemed supplies? Uh, the most common example is when uh, the goods or services that you've purchased and claim input tax on are supplied onwards free of cost or without consideration. Or when you purchase them with the intention of using them for taxable supplies, but eventually apply them for non-taxable supplies. Or you purchase them for making or using them for the, in the course of business, but then apply them for personal purposes or non-economic activity. These are common instances that uh, where the scope of supply is extended and for the purposes of VAT, these are deemed to be supplies. So either you need to charge a VAT on the transaction on the supply or you need to forego the input tax that you have claimed on the goods or services you've used to make such supplies. If we go on to the next slide now, we can deal with can we go on to the next slide? We deal with the time of supply. So the time of supply, as I mentioned earlier, helps ascertain at what point in time the obligation to tax arises. The general rule is tax or VAT would be payable at the earliest of the date of supply, date of issuance of tax invoice, or the date of receipt of payment. Now, this means that whenever there are instances of advances, you need to understand your tax obligations. In case of continuous supplies, where there is an arrangement for periodic invoices or periodic payments, you need to look at the earliest of the date of payment specified in the tax invoice or the date of payment itself. There are a couple of other transaction types which warrant a special time of supply rule, but these are of limited relevance to the business. If we move on to the next slide, we then discuss the place of supply. The place of supply helps ascertain the tax jurisdiction, uh, helps identify which tax authority would be uh, eligible uh, to tax these transactions. We've discussed supply of goods extensively in the last two sessions that we've had. Supply of oil and gas and water have different place of supply rules, which will be discussed when we have our session on oil and gas. What's important for this session is the place of supply rules for supply of services and a couple of special cases. Supply of services. Services for the purposes of VAT are anything other than supply of goods. It could be an active act of making a supply of certain service. It could be a passive act where you may abstain from doing an act or uh, uh, tolerate an act. And if you receive a consideration in exchange, that in itself could also qualify as a supply of service. Now the Place of supply rules for services, as I said, are different from goods and special cases. And when you have a taxable business in Oman making supplies to a customer who is not taxable or not registered in any of the GCC states, the supply is deemed to have taken place in Oman. So the Oman tax authority has the right to tax this uh, transaction unless it's specifically exempted or zero rated. In all other cases, it is the place of residence of the customer. When we look at the special cases, what's important to focus on is transportation of goods and passengers. In such cases, the supply is deemed to have taken place in the country where the transport originates. If we can move on to the next slide, we then look at the input tax recovery mechanism, critical to the entire scheme of VAT. Input tax 
is allowed to be recovered on goods or services that are used or intended to be used for making a taxable supply. Taxable supply is standard rated supply or zero rated supply or an exempt supply outside Oman. Now it's recoverable only by registered persons on the basis of a valid tax invoice and a taxable person or a registered person has three years from the end of the tax period in which the right arises to avail the input tax credit. Uh, it's allowed on goods which are uh, lost, stolen or damaged, but subject to conditions allowed on commercial samples up to a certain value subject to conditions. It is not allowed on goods on which uh, there is a prohibition on import or trading in Oman or certain types of expenses. Now, while the list of expenses on which input tax credit is blocked will be set out in the executive regulations, this is likely to be entertainment expenses, uh, motor vehicles used for private purposes, and similar expenses which have been disallowed in the rest of the GCC. Input tax credit may have to be adjusted where there are purchase returns, where there are bad debt adjustments, where there are uh, credit notes issued by the uh, vendor. And in instances where these are used for making taxable as well as exempt supplies, you may need to apportion the input tax credit that is directly attributable to exempt supplies as well as a portion of common expenses to the extent it is attributable to um, exempt supplies. We are expecting that uh, the executive regulations will also detail the conditions based on which businesses that are currently not registered will be allowed to claim input tax credit retrospectively. This will be important because if we are imposing VAT or if we are introducing VAT on a staggered basis, there will be businesses which may register on the 1st of July, 1st of October, 1st of April, and may want to claim pre-registration input tax credit. If we can move on to the next slide and I can quickly walk you through the compliance requirements, invoices would be required for all transactions. You will be allowed to issue invoices in foreign exchange, but you will need to have the Omani Real equivalent uh, values put on the invoice. How you source the Omani Real exchange rate is put out in the uh, law. You will need to retain books uh, in case of normal transactions for 10 years, for real estate transactions for 15 years, and these will then uh, be used for reporting the returns. Returns initially are expected to be quarterly. The tax period may change at a subsequent point in time, but initially all the returns would have to be filed quarterly within one month of the date of the, or the end of the tax quarter. And there will be provisions for refund, which will be critical for this industry because uh, you could qualify for zero rating. So all the input tax that you accumulate, you may recover by way of a refund from the tax authority. And there are other instances in which uh, businesses, individuals, organizations may be eligible to claim refund. With that, I'll request Rob to now take issues that are peculiar for the transport and logistics sector. Rob, over to you. Thank you very much, Abba. So I'm going to be touching on some key issues, questions that you should be considering as you prepare for the VAT's introduction in just over a month from now. So these are general observations and obviously you should review how these might apply to your specific circumstances. So there's a list there, um, Ashok sort of uh, alluded to a few of these, but let's start with the treatment and scope of international transport because that's the one that's probably most relevant to most of you who are participating um, this morning. So. The transport and logistics sector is very broad, covering local domestic transport and international transport, both inbound and outbound. It involves port operators, freight forwarders, shipping agents, third party logistics suppliers, um, warehousing and storage on and off site. So there's a broad range of participants in this particular industry. As Abba mentioned, Article 51 of the Oman law says that zero rate will apply to the international transport of goods and passengers and supplies connected with such transport. 
So we'll look at suppliers connected with international transport shortly. So while international transport is to be zero rated, local transport of freight will be subject to the standard rate of 5%. While Article 47 in the Oman VAT law says that local passenger transport will be exempt. And we'll have a little look at local passenger transport um, later as well. So the sector could be subject to 5%, 0% or exempt treatment on their supplies. And so it's going to be really critical to understand which basket your services will fall into. Obviously, that's easier said than done, but if you get it wrong, it can prove very, very costly if there's an audit sometime down the track. When it comes to international transport, this may also be out of scope rather than zero rated. So before considering what rate of tax may be applicable to your services, you need to establish if the place of supply is in Oman. And if it is, then it'll be subject to the Oman VAT law. And it's only then that you need to look to see, okay, if the place of supply is Oman for my services, what rate will be applicable, if any? And so when we look at um, Article 24 of the Amman VAT law, whereas we saw in Arba's slide earlier that there are some special place of supply rules. And one of those is for transport, such that the place of supply is where the transport begins. So if your services are being provided in respect of international transport that begins outside of Oman, then shouldn't this be treated as out of scope rather than zero rated? Whereas if it's in relation to an outbound supply of international transport, then the zero rating provisions would apply. Now, this has particular implications for invoicing and what needs to be reported on your VAT return. If your supply is taxable, at either the standard rate or at zero, it's zero rated, you need to issue a tax invoice. On the other hand, if it's out of scope, then you just need to issue your normal commercial documents. So correctly identifying whether your supply is going to be treated as out of scope from a Oman VAT perspective or zero rated is going to impact how you might adjust your current IT functions. Obviously, if the services relate to transport from a place outside Oman to another place outside Oman, in other words, you're arranging for the transport of goods from, say, uh, London to New York, then this will clearly be out of scope. It won't be subject to Oman VAT. So you can see there's lots of different permutations here, the five, the zero, um, out of scope can all come into play depending on the particular arrangements that are in place. Then, of course, issues arise about, well, where does international transport start and finish? Is it at the port or the final destination? In other words, where your customer's place of business or warehouse is. If final destination, then does your service need to be part of a single transport arrangement for all of the services to be zero rated? And we'll look at um, some different legs of the transport uh, arrangement shortly. So what proof do you need to support the zero rate treatment that you're going to apply? Often, you may not have access to all the documentation or the original contract to transport. You might be an intermediary in this whole um, arrangement, the contractual arrangement between a party overseas and the customer in Oman. So as I mentioned, 
we need to wait for the executive regulations to help us provide some more guidance in how some of these things will be treated and hopefully answer some of these questions along with some guidance material. If we look at the scope of services in connection with international transport, so the VAT treatment of services in connection with international transport will follow that of the international transport. So if the international transport is out of scope, so will the services connected with that. If it's zero rated, then so will the services connected with that zero rated international transport. Now, the range of activities associated with international transport is very broad. It's not just loading, unloading, but it can include, include a range of value added activities. So again, the key will be to understand what will be the scope of services which are connected with international transport. What we do know from the way it's being applied in other GCC VAT jurisdictions is that it covers a range of things like the loading and unloading at the port, storage at the port, repacking, piloting services, security around the cargo, um, document preparation. So generally it's the things that are necessary for international transportation to take place. So all of which may be treated as qualifying for zero rated provided they are part of international transport. So here, care needs to be taken when, for example, someone at the port might hire facilities to another operator. So while the facilities themselves may ultimately be used for international transport, the hiring of the facility to another operator is not expected to be sufficiently connected with international transport to qualify for zero rating. It's just a supply of um, access to um, or the use of cranes and loading equipment. So it's not directly connected with international transport. So again, the key here is to see what the executive regulations will cover and what conditions need to be satisfied in order to apply the zero rating. Obviously, we appreciate that time's running really short. As Ashok mentioned, 36 days, including weekends. And you need to configure your systems in advance of the 16th of April. And you need to communicate with your suppliers and your customers accordingly. So this is where we as advisors can help you in understanding what the general practice is across the region. So you can then take a more informed decision about how to proceed, how to configure your systems so that you'll be ready in 36 days time come 16 April. What will be critical in this process is for you to document the commercial decisions that you take and the basis on which those decisions were taken. Obviously, when the regulations come out, there may or may not be time to adjust some of those or make some manual adjustments. Transshipment can also present some challenges because this could in involve moving goods from a customer's warehouse to the port for temporary storage or repacking before it might eventually leave Oman at some point. It can involve goods coming into one port before moving on to another port in Oman and then eventually outside Oman. So would these all qualify for zero rating as international transport? Does it matter that the journey may be broken, that different legs are provided by different suppliers using different means of transport? a lorry to get it to the port, a ship to ship it to, um, or outside of Oman. 
And this takes me neatly into the next point about end-to-end -end transport versus an independent supply. So here, it is important to assess whether you are providing the international transport and have subcontracted some leg to others, but it's all part of your service to the customer, which is the international transport, or whether you are yourself a subcontractor providing, say, only the local leg for an international freight arranger, such as picking up from the port and delivering to the local Oman customer's warehouse. So in this case, you need to assess whether you as a subcontractor are providing services that are connected with or are providing international transport, or you are just providing domestic transport, which we saw earlier, if it's freight related, then it's 5% and won't qualify for zero rating. So again, it's going to be really critical to retain the appropriate documentation in the event of any challenge from the tax authorities to substantiate that your supply was in fact an international supply of transport and not just a domestic um, transport leg that was your supply. Now, in most arrangements, there's demurrage and, and other related um, charges are sometimes imposed. Now, these are often defined as being a penalty or compensation for overstaying beyond a normal leeway at the port. Normally you're given some days leeway. If you overstay that, then there might be additional um, charges imposed. There might be additional storage charges imposed if the goods haven't left in the time that was agreed. So how is this charge meant to be treated from a VAT perspective? Where the charge is truly in the nature of a penalty, it may be considered as not being a supply for VAT purposes. No one's making a supply, it's just a penalty that's being imposed on the other party, in which case it's treated as out of scope. But you need to be careful that you can characterize it as it being a penalty rather than as a charge for some underlying supply. For example, if it was a, a charge in relation to um, storage and this penalty or compensation was just that equals the cost of say one or two days normal storage costs, then the authorities are likely to treat that not as a penalty or compensation, but rather as a rental charge. You've just extended um, rental to the, the customer. So even if it is taxable, then you still need to assess well, could it qualify for zero rating as being connected with international transport? So yes, it could be out of scope. It could be taxable. If it's taxable, it could be at the rate of zero if it can come under um, a zero rating for a supply connected with international transport. So the nature and character of these charges all need to be carefully considered as well. Special zones. So the VAT law, Article 54 in particular, provides for goods and services from, to, or within special economic zones to be treated in the same fashion as the customs suspension. So generally, if the customs duty is suspended, then we would expect the VAT to equally be suspended. 
and then we would expect the normal VAT rules to apply when the goods are released from suspension. So if they're coming out of one of these special economic zones into mainland Oman, you would expect the normal um, customs import rules and therefore the VAT to apply to that importation of goods. We do expect though that the regulations will outline a range of conditions which will need to be met. So again, it's gonna be important to have reference to what those conditions might be. Many of you may already have experience with free zones in the UAE, nearly the whole of the UAE is a free zone. So I guess I would just caution you in applying that same concept in the context of Amman. Until we see what the regulations specifically say, we can't just assume that the free zone treatment from a VAT perspective in the UAE will be mirrored in Oman. So just a word of caution there. Another important issue is to consider in what capacity are you providing your services? Are you acting as an agent for a principal or are you acting in your own right? So again, Article 19 of the VAT law notes that if an agent makes a supply in the name of the principal, then the principal is still responsible for all the VAT obligations on that supply, not the agent. But if the agent does not disclose that they are acting for a principal and they make the supply in their name, then they will need to account for the VAT on the supply as if they were the principal. They become and stand in the shoes of the principal. So this can have significant implications on who is liable for the VAT on the supply, the agent or the principal. So again, it's important that the relationship between an agent and a principal is clearly documented as to the particular responsibilities and have regard to who is actually issuing the invoices. Is it the agent issuing the invoices and not disclosing that the supply is being made on behalf of the principal? When it comes to reimbursements and disbursements, I mean, it typically a, 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 an international freighter will take care of all the customs clearance, including the VAT. So when that happens, um, they are effectively paying the, VA, the VAT and the customs duty on behalf of the customer. So when they recover that charge, they're not making a supply. It's a disbursement, it's out of scope. However, any service fees that is charged by the freighter for these services would generally be expected to be subject to VAT, although they may also qualify for a VAT at either the five or the zero. So that would need to be looked at carefully. So- Rob, it, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you, Rob, uh, just conscious of the time. So if you can please uh, sure. deal with the rest of your session uh, early so that- uh, uh, Yeah, and, thanks. Thanks, Ashok. So not too long to finish off. So um, transitional contracts, I think you're all aware of the fact that um, the transitional arrangements are such that if you provide any services after the 16th of April, you're going to need to account for VAT. So have you as a business looked at all your contracts and arrangements and ensured that you're able to pass the VAT through? If not, it could potentially become a cost to you, unless of course, you're providing exempt local passenger transport, in which case there's no VAT to be passed through. But in this case, you won't be able to recover the VAT in your business inputs. So there's gonna be cost pressures on you to lift your prices. So does your contract lock you in to a fixed price, in which case you end up absorbing the VAT cost? Um, we mentioned about local passenger transport being exempt. So in Oman, it's exempt. In KSA, for example, it's taxable at 15%. So different treatment. And as I mentioned, if it's exempt, then that means 
that there might be additional operating costs insofar as you cannot recover the VAT on your business inputs. How broadly will local passenger transport be defined? We need to wait and see what the regulations say. Um, when it comes to compliance obligations for overseas carriers, I mean, as I mentioned, there, there is no threshold for a non-resident making taxable supplies in um, Oman. Most carriers are probably selling tickets and most of those tickets are going to be international tickets, which will be zero rated. But that's still taxable supply. It still counts towards the threshold for VAT registration purposes. So that's something that um, carriers need to be conscious of. Cash flow is going to be really, really important because if you're largely providing only zero rated international transport or related services, then you might find yourself in a net refund position. So you'll be waiting for a refund from the tax authorities. And as Eva mentioned, the first filing is not going to be due until the end of July. And then how quickly will the authorities refund the money to you? So you're going to need to take that into account because it's going to be a drain on your cash flow. So I'm sorry if I've taken a bit of time, but look, they're just some key issues that you need to consider. And I'll now hand over to um, Julie. Yes, thank you, Rob. Um, so uh, given uh, the timing, I'll uh, try to uh, give you just a quick glimpse of uh, what is relevant uh, in terms of uh, setup of your IT landscape uh, to be VAT ready. Uh, as you can see from this slide, there are a lot of different uh, VAT touch points um, from the system perspective and obviously uh, given five minutes uh, left of our official time and we want uh, to, um, we, we, we have quite a few questions in the Q&A, we want to address that as well. So um, I'll probably touch uh, on a couple of things that uh, you can already start doing, even though some of the um, uh, things are unclear because we don't have the executive regulations. Uh, there are a number of things that you already can do uh, in terms of preparation. And that is uh, essentially looking, um, uh, this is the base of all of your VAT determination, that is your master data. Uh, for those of you who are already registered uh, for uh, VAT in Oman, uh, you might have already uh, noticed, first of all, that uh, some of the customers and vendors have already started uh, exchanging those uh, the information about those numbers. And uh, why uh, might people be doing this? Because uh, first of all, you uh, you will need to uh, make sure that your own uh, registration number is on your invoices, but also you want to know who of your vendors are already registered for VAT, uh, so that uh, once you receive the invoice from them, you can actually verify is it correct that they are charging me VAT or not. Uh, we also expect that um, the VAT number uh, of your customer will be a required field in terms of um, uh, invoice requirements. Hence, you would want to collect those uh, VAT numbers and make sure that uh, you can print those on your uh, invoice layout uh, to provide your customers with compliant tax invoice uh, so that they can recover the VAT that you charge them. Uh, and even though for those who uh, of you who already have implemented VT in uh, UAE or KSA or Bahrain, uh, you would still need to revisit your current uh, system uh, setup because the format of the Oman VET registration number is slightly different from what we've seen in uh, other GCC countries. Because Oman has gone for the alphanumeric uh, uh, format where it starts with OM and has 10 digits. Uh, so those, um, uh, th that capability of your system to have uh, alphanumeric number, that's something that needs to be checked. Um, then obviously, uh, specifically for your sector, uh, it, it seems that in logistics, you can have all the different variants of 5% uh, zero rated and exempt. Hence, you would need to set up 
all of the possible uh, tax codes in your systems, just to be sure that once the re regulations can come out and you know which transaction will apply which treatment, you basically already have the basic setup in your system to only link the two together and uh, proceed uh, uh, with, with your transactions. Um, and finally, uh, what I want to mention is um, I already said that the invoice will be very important and not only I, all of the speakers mentioned invoice becomes very important in the VAT environment. So you can already start looking at all the different invoice layouts that you already uh, currently use and see which ones uh, of them will you continue uh, using and what do you need to do to update those uh, to be compliant tax invoices. So uh, with these couple of uh, pointers, um, I uh, give it back to um, Abba to take you through the next steps. Thanks, Julie. I'll make this quick. Um, I think the message is consistent and clear. That impacts all facets of your business, not just a tax or a finance project. It's a business transformation project, and you need to work collectively towards a smooth transition. Uh, with only four days to go for registrations, 36 for go live and 141 for the first return, you need to prioritize some mission critical items that you can do between now and go live. Uh, please understand your registration obligations and comply. Failure to register in time could have penal implications. You also need to assess whether you want to register as a VAT group, whether you want to look at voluntary registrations or after you weigh your pros and cons. Understand your tax liability on every transaction. Apply for exceptions if you're eligible for them. Make sure you re review your contracts wherever you need to amend them. Engage in commercial discussions with your customers. Uh, make sure that the IT systems are upgraded and please have a cutover strategy in place. Transitioning to VAT in itself is difficult. Having to do it in the middle of a month makes it even more difficult. And make sure that you upskill your staff. Uh, and you also educate your customers and vendors because they are a part of your business environment. Go live is for 16th of April, but that is just the beginning. That's not the end. A lot of clarifications as we've seen in the rest of the GCC will flow after the 16th of April. You may need to revisit positions. You may need to revisit configurations in the systems. So you need to stay agile. With that, we can wrap up the session today and we can move to Q&A. Thank you, Abba. So we are, we have another 10, 15 minutes. We will uh, look at the questions that have been raised. There are quite a few questions coming in. Thank you for that. Let me, let me uh, start with a question relating to this particular sector, which has come in. And uh, I, can I, can I ask Rob to address this in case of couriers? Uh, taking place from Oman to the rest of the world. I think what he's meaning is originating from Oman to the rest of the world. Uh, we are charging a standard tariff. And uh, on top of that, uh, they have to levy, uh, they have to charge the levy, which is payable to the TRA as a royalty. So the question is, would VAT apply on the levy too? <coughs> Rob? Sorry. Um, so the levy depends on whether the levy is a government charge. So as I mentioned, if it's being collected um, and it's generally levied on the actual customer, but it's just being collected by the courier, then it would not be subject to uh, VAT on top. And in any case, if it is um, related to the international transport, it should be zero rated. Okay. Not sure, Abba, do you have any comment on that? So I think you would need to look at the nature of the levy, as Rob said. If these are charges that you're collecting on behalf of the government and paying them to the government um, on behalf of the customer, then they can be classified as disbursements and not be subject to VAT. But if they aren't, if they are just an extension of the consideration that you're charging the customer, these should be included in the taxable value. What you need to remember, though, is the tax treatment of the entire transaction. 
So if the underlying transaction is going to be zero rated, so if your courier qualifies as an international transportation of goods and is eligible for zero rating, then all these additions which are incidental or ancillary to the uh, main supply should also be eligible for zero rating. Okay. This this question, uh, Abha, if you can address, uh, it's it's the question is in case of international imports being done on part of an overseas agent, the invoice would include international freight, customs clearance, port charges, uh, transportation to the end customer. Would the full invoice be zero rated? So let's split this into two parts. If we're looking at what value should be subject to uh, VAT uh, for the import of goods, you need to look at the CIF value. That is the value of goods plus carriage insurance and freight as they consider in customs. You need to add on top of that any customs fee that has been paid, any customs duty that has been paid. If the goods are liable to excise tax, then top that up as well. This is your taxable base. This is the value on which you would charge VAT if applicable. This is for the import of goods. If you're looking at import, uh, if you're looking at the transportation as such, you would need to look at which of these elements qualify for zero rating, which of these are taxable, and pay VAT on the element that is taxable. Okay. This question, you know, I, I know that there, there too many IT related questions, but uh, you know it's a bad question, and I'm uh, I, I would request Julie to have a go at it. Uh, so this uh, person says that they are into a transport business of bitumen goods. We have a monthly agreement with the local bitumen company to transport their goods to customers. We also transport bitumen from port, uh, that is the ship, to the company's storage facility, bitumen storage facility. Should we charge VAT on our monthly invoice to the customer? The bitumen uh, is VAT exempted, he says. I'm not sure uh, that last bit. Either Julie or uh, you know, yeah. Abha, uh, whoever has some clarity on this. No, happy to pick this up. Uh, Thank this you. sounds like a, a local transportation, uh, and therefore, uh, as, as it is a local transportation, it will be uh, taxable. And um, the 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 underlying uh, supply of goods actually is not relevant uh, in determination of logistic services. Logistic services need to be um, uh, assessed separately, and there uh, we look at where transportation starts and uh, where it ends in order to determine the treatment. Uh, even if your uh, customer uh, is for example, zero rated or exempt, uh, their their status does not change the treatment of the logistic services that uh, you would be providing. So therefore, if you charge VAT to them, then they will see based on their uh, recovery right whether they can recover this VAT or not. If they their supplies are zero rated, they would be recovering VAT and they would have the cash flow uh, disadvantage of and needing to wait on the authorities to actually uh, refund them the money. Um, okay. The only thing I'd like to add over there is um, uh, bitumen. Yes, you can look at it as a hydrocarbon uh, because of which you may be under the assumption that it should be zero rated. But if you look at the Uman VAT law, it zero rates the supply of crude oil, natural gas, and oil derivatives. What from whatever we've heard so far. It appears that you're not engaged in the supply of bitumen, but the transportation of bitumen. So in order for you to qualify for any zero rating of local transport of bitumen, you would need to look at any zero rating that is extended. Uh, and this is not in the Oman VAT law. The executive regulations will provide clarity on this. Zero rating for goods or services that are provided to the oil and gas sector. Now, uh, they may also come with conditions attached to it. So uh, that's a decision you'll have to make um, uh, on the tax treatment based on the exemptions or the zero rating extended to supplies made to the oil and gas sector and the conditions attached to it. Okay, thank you. 
this uh, is a question which I could uh, pose to uh, Rob. The question is, can the subcontractor zero rate the services provided for the purpose of international transport? I hope the question is clear. Uh, the, the questioner actually goes on to say, although the subcontractor is providing international transport, that that doesn't seem to uh, make sense. So if you just look at the first part of the question, can subcontractor zero rate the services provided, I guess, to a, another party, the main contractor who is engaged in international transport, would uh, his services, subcontractor services qualify for zero rate? So, um, as I mentioned, um, when I was looking at some of the issues, it's important to understand whether you are providing international transport or not. So, if you are just a subcontractor and you're just being asked to pick up goods from a customer in Oman's warehouse and deliver that to the port, then you are only providing domestic transport and not international transport. So you will need to charge 5% VAT. Whoever has arranged for you to provide that service as part of their service, which is international transport, they are the ones who will be able to zero rate all of their charges. But your charge to the person you're subcontracting to would be subject to VAT at 5%. Right. This is a practical question, given that uh, the executive regulations are not yet out. And the questioner uh, asks, how do we apply uh, VAT to our uh, port activities? I think what, what that person means is, how do you undertake the uh, mapping of, of the transactions and determine the VAT consequences in the absence of executive regulations? So, uh, Abha, if you can please uh, uh, provide your experience on this. Sure. So what you can do at this point in time is you have the law, you don't have the Oman bad executive regulations. What you do have is some guidance from the rest of the GCC. So you have the UAE, you have KSA as well as Bahrain. All three of them have in some shape and form zero rated services in relation to international transportation. So you would need to look at guidance coming from these three countries in order for you to take some reasonable assumptions in ascertaining the tax treatment. But having said that, this can only be for guidance purpose. You will need to revalidate these once the executive regulations are issued. And in the absence of a specific zero rating, you would want to err on the side of caution and want to charge a VAT. But that is only if the executive regulations aren't issued in time and you do not have enough clarity based on the guides that we expect to come out of the tax authority in due course. Uh, yes, now, uh, Julie, uh, this question to you, uh, it, it, the, the person is asking confirmation of his understanding that local transportation services will be taxable at 5% and transportation services linked to imports and exports will be taxable or will be zero rated. Is that understanding correct? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the basic rule. And I think uh, going back to the previous uh, question, uh, I think if you take that as a basis, uh, then this is you will probably cover with that 90% uh, of your cases. And if there are some uh, exceptions and uh, you would need to uh, address it once the regulations are released, even if they are released after we uh, go live, then Potentially, you can always issue a credit note and a new invoice to correct the treatment previously applied. Right. I think I will I will uh, ask a few more questions. Uh, Abba, this one is for you. This is not related to uh, the the transport and logistics per se, but uh, still, it's 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 a question which is relevant for all businesses. Uh, will import a VAT be payable to the customs authority along with customs duties at the Oman border at the time of import, or will the tax authority be allowing for deferment uh, for the payment of import VAT? So I think there are two questions set into that, and let me take both separately. One is at what point in time will you need to pay the VAT on imports? The answer to that is if you look at the Oman VAT law, the general rule is 
that you will need to pay VAT in cash at the time of customs clearance upfront. And then you can claim credit of the VAT paid uh, depending on whether it's eligible or not. The uh, VAT law does make an exception, allows importers to apply to the tax authority for a deferral. If you make an application, uh, and you can make an application only if you satisfy the conditions. If you make an application that is approved by the tax authority, you will you will be allowed to defer the payment of VAT from the time of customs clearance to the time of filing the returns. So effectively, it will only become an entry on your return, import of goods, import VAT. And if you're eligible to claim input tax credit, you claim it on the same return. So that's the timing. So far as the procedure is concerned, if you have to pay this in cash, we will need to see on how that is arranged, whether you would need to deposit this with the uh, ROP customs at the time of customs clearance, uh, uh, just the same way uh, excise tax is, and then claim a refund or a uh, input tax on the returns on the basis of certain documents uh, or otherwise. So that clarity is still awaited from the tax authority. Okay, last uh, question. And, and this question I can ask uh, Rob to address and sum it up. Is there any implication on recognizing input VAT on lease charges paid for cars and other vehicles which are used by employees for business purposes? So, um, as Abba mentioned uh, in her little table she had on input recovery, there will be certain business expenses where the VAT recovery will be blocked even if they are going to be used in the business's taxable activities. Now, we don't yet have a list of those in Oman. We need to wait for the executive regulations, but we do know from experience in UAE, KSA and Bahrain that they do restrict it when it comes to either the purchase or leasing of motor vehicles where there is any element of private use by employees. So where there's any element of private use by employees of a vehicle that's either purchased or leased, then the um, regulations are likely to deny the recovery of the VAT on the, so that will then become a cost. And unlike other types of business assets that might be used partially for business and partially for um, non-business purposes. The um, denial for motor vehicles seems to be 100% if there is any private use. So it's not one where you apportion based on the amount of private use. And just to add to what Rob said, in some jurisdictions in the GCC, it's not just the actual use of the motor vehicle for business uh, for private purposes, even making the asset available, not using, but making the asset available for private use by employees could uh, result into a disallowance of input tax credit. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, all the panelists, and uh, of course to all the attendees. You know there were a number of questions that were raised. I hope you found the answers useful as well as the presentation and the transport and logistics spe sector specific issues. We will, uh, as is our practice, be sharing with you our presentation uh, separately in the coming uh, couple of days. So thank you once again for joining us and uh, I do hope we, we meet once again in some of the other uh, sessions which we are having next week. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye.